mis en, en boucle à travers le campus de Bernard. Euh, fait on fait ça avec Miguel, on fait ça avec Concordia, puis on fait ça avec John Corporation, an incorporated company, it's, it's really about dealing with the liabilities also and the funding. So, let's say you have a restaurant, probably one entity will own the building, one other entity will own the restaurant, and one other entity will run the farm. So that if one goes not well, you're we not impacting the whole thing. You can get funding for a farm, you can get funding for, for a restaurant, and then you have a building that is... But that's, that, that's more in the business class that you, you get those things. And that's what's great about, about Miguel, you can go to business class too. <laughs> and then you can go to farming class, and you can go to art class. Um, so a lot of this structural and organizational stuff has yet to be kind of fine-tuned, because we just had one year with it. And we wanna, makes a big difference to make yeah. it efficient. So yeah, um, I think this is pretty nice also the store wait. there and you get eaten by mice. I do have a well, there's a question. Hoops. We've been having a really hard time finding to find a good storage method yeah. for those. How do you do them? Yeah, well, that is very that's not, not permanent. Not inside for sure. Not inside. Do they rust though? Do you leave them outside or do you them? Well, it's, uh, what you can do is, let's say you have like a PVC pipe, mm -hmm. you just put it in, mm -hmm. but otherwise, hooks, yeah. Yeah. and you strap them by bunches of pen, okay. and strap them together with a rope or with tape. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can get some that aren't, that you can buy, and they're... They're, they're more expensive a bit, but they're straight, and they'll bend, but they'll, they'll straighten up, uh -huh. and then you can store them okay. in a tube. It's like a bit like that. Yeah, we try with that. Tubes. We just need to have more space for that, and this people started putting way too many in, so. You'll have fun when you see your, your job. Yeah, that was, we had a lot of issues with that this year with seating. Yeah. Good job. Well, Good job. thank you. So, Jean-Martin Fortier, uh, I'm very happy uh, to introduce him. Uh, it's a great honor for, for me to, to do so. Um, so, he is the, the author of a best-selling book, The Market Gardener. Um, he is the farmer behind farms like Quatre Temps, which uh, sells its produce at Jean Talon Market. Um, he was the producer and host of a Quebec television show called Les Fermiers. He's also a graduate <laughs> of McGill University and he spent time right here on this campus, McDonald campus, and he did his master's degree in the School of Environment. Yeah, the school it was environment. an undergraduate right. in the School of Environment. Right. And I used to, I did a summer semester here, and my wife, my girlfriend, same, same person, <laughs> um, we used to kayak because we lived on an island here. It was amazing. The best summer ever. Uh, and just recently, La Presse, the well-known Quebec newspaper, uh, came out with 15 influencers. So 15 influencers in Quebec, and he was one of the 15. So, uh, <laughs> so it's my great pleasure to introduce John. What I'd like to do is perhaps show you a bit of my story so you have an understanding of perhaps who I am or what I've done in the last 20 years. But quickly, I'd like to turn around and just have a nice discussion with you guys. Because for me, uh, once, uh, not too long ago, I was sitting right there and I was really wondering what to do with my life. And not what to do with my life in regards to what my job would be, or, but how I could be of service to change the world for the better. Because I was studying environmental disaster here at McGill. And after three years of being educated on environmental uh, crisis, 
educated on food, where it comes from, how destructive the current food system is. Uh, it, it, it felt like the three years that I was at McGill, it was just getting, uh, becoming aware of all the destruction, of all the problems, of, of, of all that the future of the planet, the doom and gloom that we, it, it felt like after three years I had just studied all the problems and I was like, okay, you know, what's, 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 what am I going to do with this? And I was really committed to having a positive impact. I really felt that I had something in me I could bring to the table to make a difference. And I'm sure most of you, and hopefully, this is how you're feeling. It's like, okay, there's a, there's a lot of big challenges for your generation, for our, my generation, but what are we going to do about it? And so I was sitting here. And then I had my kind of career, it's not over yet, but this is going to be my 20th season in farming. And, you know, I, I made an impact, I made a difference, and I'm really proud of that, but, you know, it's, that's just, I'm proud of that because that's what I wanted to accomplish for myself, but the problems are still there. And hopefully some of you guys will pick it up and want to have a positive contribution also, because really the world needs it. So if we can conclude our session together by perhaps addressing some of your questions, some of your concerns, or where you guys want to be at later on, I'm interested in that more than my story, because I've heard my story a million times. <laughs> I'm just sharing it so we're on the same level. So we talked about uh, small-scale farming. This is a quick video of my farm that was established in 2004. Um, it's about a two-acre field, so it's a, big, a bit bigger than a football field. Uh, and in the middle of that, there's a barn. It used to be a rabbit barn. We built our house there. Um, and what this farm does is feed a lot of people. There's more than 200 families that get the CSA share. We go at Farmer's Market on Saturday. And, you know, it's less than two acres under cultivation. We have no tractor. We use hand tools. Uh, it's a beautiful space to, to live, to work where, where we are. We build a lot of ecological niches all around and in the space. And so it's a small, small farm, but it has had a big impact. Uh, and the impact is illustrating, showcasing that small can be really ecological and economical. So this farm generates a really nice income for my wife and I. Um, and it's feeding a lot of people. And we're using ecological you know, methods of working the soil. Or not working the soil, actually. Okay. So, uh, this is our farm in number. This is my, my girlfriend, my wife, uh, Modelaine. We met here at McGill. Uh, she was actually the first friend that I met when I came. Um, and we were best friends for a few years, and then we became more than that. That's, that's, I'm not going to go into detail about that. Uh, so, the farm is 15, now 17 years in operation. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's been, it's been quite a project, but it's been fun. And this is a picture, next, next picture is when her and I started in farming, we had no experience, we didn't grow up on a farm. My parents aren't hippies, her parents aren't hippies. Uh, her, her, her parents had an auto parts. My, 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 my father worked for Bell Canada. Skateboarding, snowboarding was my childhood. Uh, but yeah, coming to McGill, like I said, and then realizing that there was a lot of wrongdoing in the world and that we really needed to do things differently, and, and farming became how we did that. And it was really because when we started to work on a farm, things became hands-on. And that was really empowering. It's like leaving the textbook, leaving the theory behind, leaving even like you know, going to manifestations to against WTO, 
protests and all of that, being against something, for me just didn't cut it. I, I felt like I wanted to do something. And when I started to farm, I was, I was doing something with my hands, we were growing food, we were selling it directly, we were creating community, and it just made so much sense for us. But, so that's a picture when we were about 24, about your age. We knew nothing about farming. That's a really nice picture because you know, the basket is empty. Uh, squash is probably the easiest crop to grow. Uh, everything's wilted around. It's like, you know, we, we learned a lot through the years, I can tell you that. Then the next picture is a picture of our tool shed. And the, the tool shed is a bit more complex now, but it's pretty much those tools that we bought in 2004. And we feed, we feed people with those tools, we make a living for ourselves, and there's no tractor. These are all hand tools that don't need to be, they're not expensive. Anyone can operate with those tools. And, you know, it's just, it's really, it's really empowering to think that uh, low tech might be a better idea in farming. Uh, this was one of our first and biggest influence uh, when I visited farms in Cuba. Back then, that was the fall off of the Soviet Union, and Cuba didn't have any fossil fuel on the island. And so all of their farming became 100% organic because they didn't have any fuel to put in the tractors. They had all these Soviet tractors, no parts to repair, no fuels to run them. All the fertilizers that are used in conventional farming, they're all made out of fossil fuel, so no pesticides, no herbicides, no fungicides, no fertilizers. So the whole island became 100% organic. And for growing vegetables, that was their model. Organoponicos, which are raised beds of densely planted crops. And you have, you would see thousands of these beds in the cities, around the cities, in the suburb, in, in the country. It was all the same system. And the people that were farming were gardeners. They were gardeners with hand tools, and they were planting, harvesting, transplanting, feeding the soil with compost. It's really amazing to see like such a big such a big amount of land farmed without tractors and 100% organic. So that was really cool. And that became pretty much what we did on our farm. Raised beds, um, hand tools, and a walk behind tractor. So we have a tractor, the two-wheel tractor. Uh, it's low tech. We use about $400 of fuel per year, which is not a lot. And, you know, different tools that over the years have become designed, developed for this kind of model of farming, which we call market gardening. Okay? And market gardening is really nothing new. A lot of my best tricks that I got in, from, in farming and market gardening we're reading books that came out of France in the 1800s, 1900s, uh, before World War II. All of the farming books, that was pre-industrialized agriculture, pre-tractor-based farming. It's, everyone was kind of farming like that. And that was feeding the world at the time. Especially around Paris, where, where market gardeners were really, really efficient city of three million people uh, fed year-round by 10,000 small farms that were close to the city. And that for me is a model of where we could be going uh, in the future. Replacing mass production, which is really cheap and poisonous food, poisons the land and the rivers by production by the mass where people are living on land, uh, in an environmental setup, in a community, intertwined by other farms, by other food hubs, uh, 
uh, by a rural a, grand, a rural economy that is you know really cool in itself super sustainable su super local that is also feeding the city so that's what I have in mind big picture uh, my book the market gardener uh, actually in 10 languages and it sold over 2,100 copies but it's a how-to book well, very practical it's not philosophical or ideological very this is how we do the bed prep for the beds this is how we seed the carrots this is the seeder we use this is the plate of the cedar. this is the spacing of the carrots on the rows this is how we cultivate them this is how we harvest them this is how we lay out the irrigation on the farm. It's a very practical book. And it still amazes me today to think about the fact that it has sold so many copies. And you might want to question, why would a technical book sell so many books and be translated in so many languages? And that's a great question. One, my answer to that question is that because the world really needs this now. And a lot of younger generations are looking for meaningful livestock. And when you imagine that you can be living on a farm in the countryside, drinking natural wines, <coughs> drinking craft beers with your friends from the local pub, where the grain is, is is grown not far, it's, it's cool. It's perhaps a lifestyle that you want if you think that you can make a living. And that's, that's what the book tells you. It's like, you can make a living in farming, but you need to be pretty well organized. You can't improvise. And writing the book was a big project for me. It took me almost two years. And then for almost seven years, eight years, I was on a speaking tour. So traveled the world, giving my message, sharing the insights of my farm, meeting a lot of people in different communities, a lot of people that are in farming communities, a lot of farmers educating, passing along information. Did conferences in barns and churches and basements. I just, I just was on a mission to share what I had learned in the with the purpose and the goal that he could help others get there. So I did that for a long time. Uh, and then I started a training farm uh, here, not, not too far from, from <coughs> about 45 minutes south of here. I found Catretin. Like Ryan said, we sell our veggies at the Jean Talon market on Saturday and Sunday. And that farm was financed by uh, very wealthy business uh, people from Quebec, Les Desmarais, and they were looking to create a farm that was holistic, that had animals, that had a food lab, that had gardens. And they were interested in showcasing what the farms of tomorrow should look like. And they ended up looking for who that farmer would be to create that farm and they went all around the world looking for what they would say is the best farmer because that's what money sometimes pays for we want the best and they ended up with me which was like 45 minutes away from the farm and so i took two years with a team of the permaculture designers to really research look what was being done elsewhere and then we created FQT farm it was a really big project there's the garden there's cows that are on pasture that are rotating there's chicken that are always on fresh grass in the summer uh, in mobile coops that we're moving following with the following the cows and there's pigs that are in the forest so always outside and you know all of that in one air and one big farm in the middle of which there's the market garden where i teach and train to new cohorts of, of young apprentice every year uh, a farm that 
is really uh, interesting with regards to how farms were before, because it's really a copy and paste of farms from, again, pre-World War II, but with all the modern aspects of it, you know, digitalizing uh, a lot of the production plans, going to market, uh, with all the marketing tools that we have available, online marketing, social media, you know, all, all of the things that are newer today combined to older ways of looking at farmland and how to cultivate and breaking from going to everything being streamlined like you, this is a chicken processing operation. It's only that. This is a cattle, beef and cattle operation, only that. This is a vegetable by having all of that on one piece of land with a food lab where some of the leftovers are are uh, transformed into canned goods, uh, meals are prepared from the farm. Really interesting, and, and a lot of what we came up with was by studying permaculture, studying the art of understanding how ecological principles work together to create synergies that are very practical and that you should bank on chicken poop under the fruit trees, they fertilize the trees, and they eat the worm that are there because the fruits, when they fall, you know, uh, worms establish themselves there, so it creates food for the chicken. So all of these kind of synergies, looking at that, and then putting that into play into a design of a modern farm. And that was what was shown by what Ryan was ta talking about, a TV show that aired for two seasons uh, on public television here on Thursday night, 8 o'clock. It became really popular. It's in French, so perhaps some of you haven't heard about it, but um, it was the most watched uh, TV on this channel ever. And again, it was slow TV. It's like an hour of us kind of farming. <laughs> There's no drama. We're not breaking up and you know, we're not kicking anybody out of the farm. And, uh, I think the next thing is this little video. <laughs> On est en train de créer une ferme à échelle humaine. Ou est-ce que c'est pas la machinerie qui est au cœur du projet? C'est juste de réapprendre, on dirait, à travailler avec les choses dans leur moment. Puis ces savoir-faire-là, ils étaient partagés de génération en génération. Puis cette chaîne-là, elle a été complètement brisée. Faut que tu sois résilient, faut que tu aies un réseau de solidarité. C'est clair qu'il faut rester inventif quand on fait de l'agriculture. L'expertise qu'ils ont amené, puis l'imagination qu'ils ont amené, ça s'achète pas, ça. Tu peux pas juste commander ça, là. Clairement, enlève les légumes. <rire> Je pense que c'est la ferme du futur. Je pense qu'elle est là. Oui, on est en train de changer le monde. Faites connaissance avec les artisans d'une véritable révolution agricole. Les fermiers. Ce soir 20h, sur Unitv. C'est cool. cool to be on Must Watch TV. <laughs> with, a, a, with a show about farming, and and the show got bought, and in, it's in like in 180 countries of of uh, all of the French media that bought the show. So anyway, all of this to say that when you believe in something, when you work at it, and when you demonstrate the potential of what could be in a positive way, and using you know, using your enthusiasm, it really opens up a lot of doors. And, and that's what I've learned from, uh, from that experience, and then translated some of that into building an online course that che teaches farmers from all over the world how I farm. It like, took us five years to document all the steps of all the crops that I grow, exactly what I do, so that it gives the insight of others how to do it my way, but it, it lessens the curve, the learning curve. So in farming, the learning curve is really big. To become a successful farmer, to, to learn all these crops, how to grow them simultaneously, in space, in time, um, 
without having any problems with insects or disease, making sure that there's enough water, not too much. There's so many details. So build an online course, and the course is now in 180 countries, helping a lot of growers that are doing the same thing that we were doing when I started in farming. And so that's really, really cool for me, having impact, again, from my, my place, what I do, spreading out the word, sharing, teaching, and inspiring people to replace mass production, production by the mass. This is really what my goal is. And I really think, in conclusion, that if there's a takeaway message, is that we need to build a new farm economy that involves everyone. Like everyone three times a day, you guys have an impact, whether you want it or not, on the food system because you eat. Okay, so and anytime you eat, the four pillars of the ethics of the food that you're eating, it should it should be it should come from an ecological standpoint. And that's how farming was before. Really knew that it's not like that, but we've replaced all of the traditional ecological knowledge by chemical, by just kind of like substituting nature with, with mechanics and chemistry. Okay, so this is like, it's a 70 year old experiment. So we're in it right now and we're imagining that that's how, that's how, we, that's how food comes and where food comes from, but that wasn't the case 100 years ago. Hundred times, you know, thousands of years, we weren't farming that way. But it also needs to be profitable. So anytime that you're uh, interested in talking about permaculture or small-scale farming or, or whatever, organic, whatever, all of this needs to be understood as a business, and it needs to work out financially because if it doesn't. It's not sustainable, and if it's not sustainable, you're not changing anything. And it needs to be human scale. Okay, so in your lifetime, you'll be bombarded with this idea that we need to have more robots in farming. That farms of the futures are vertical farms designed by engineers growing Know, strawberries in January using all of these super lead lights with with music of the future and it's like it's all engineered based but that's not what farming is farming is soil farming is intention of the people working the soil farming is that relationship with nature that is amazing like I'm a privileged person in life because I get to do applied ecology every day when I'm at the farm. This is what living is. This is what I feel good about. But a real farm uh, culture or agriculture, farming agriculture, needs to be based on humans and our relationship with the soil, with the land, with the temperature. And it needs to be nourishing. It needs to be food, food grown with care by people who care. This is the food you want to eat three times a day because that's what's going to get you healthy. That's going to get you inspired to be part of something bigger. That's going to be protecting the earth, the community, building the community. So these are the pillars. And you know, there's a lot of research out there that says that small scale farming is the future. It's, it's the present. It's actually what's feeding the world right now. So I don't know how invested some of you are with those issues, but you're sitting in a hot seat because whether you are aware of this or not, McGill and McDonald Campus is one of the prime research uh, agricultural space in Canada. So there's a lot of people that are influenced by what's being taught here. And there's a lot of things that need to be changed in what's being thought right now. So, 
and hopefully, uh, you know, you guys can be part of perhaps proposing something different, proposing how you'd like to be fed, and how you'd like to have, you know, farming done where you are. But this is what my goal has been in the last 20 years, and um, this is the work that I've applied myself to. And I'm, I'm really happy to have some recognition, but you know this this is going to be much more you guys' life's work than mine. Because I'm not at the end, but I'm not 20 anymore, you know. And so hopefully some of you are interested in some of this, and you're going to pick up the baton and keep on proposing something different, something better for our planet, something better for our health. And again, remember that, three times a day. And it's not to feel bad when we're not worried. You know, I eat poutine, it's great. But I could be eating poutine made from really cool, you know, potatoes that my neighbor grew, and cheese curd from a, uh, a farmer that has his cows outside, grass-fed. And the sauce we can make with real butter and you know so there's always an alternative of how we could be feeding ourselves better and I think it's important to have that in our mind and it's really important to support your local farmer because anytime you buy from a local farmer your money goes directly to that farmer it doesn't go through the government, then that government pays all the people that manages that money for, for you know, policies, and then a little bit comes back down, goes directly. And that makes a big difference. So I'm encouraging you to uh, think about food politics. I'm encouraging you to take action and Participate in the alternative food economy by supporting local farms, by going to the co-op, by investing your money. Even perhaps you don't have that much right now, but if this this could change uh, when you get a job and then you get a career and all of that. Make sure that you participate in the alternative. It's really important. That's it. That's it for me. That's it for me.